Hi there, it's Amy Ehlers here, and I've got a special treat for you. For the next couple of months, while I'm off leading retreats in places like Belize and beautiful wine country in California, I've decided to feature some of the most celebrated and most listened to episodes of my podcast, not only of The Amy Ehler Show, but also of The Mama Truth Show. So you're in for a treat. Please enjoy these best of episodes for the next couple of months while I'm off leading retreats and doing women's leadership work and doing keynotes. And as always, please make sure to tune in to my masterclass, Secrets the Good Old Boys Club Won't Share With You, Five Revolutionary Shifts Women Leaders Must Make Now by going to amyaylersshow.com forward slash masterclass. That's amyaylersshow.com forward slash masterclass. And make sure that you're on my email list too, okay? Because then you'll be up to date with all the newest and latest and greatest news from me. You can check that out at wakeupcallcoach.com. And now on to today's featured episode. We are going to go to a very interesting place on today's show, to say the least. We are really, and I and I thought that this was just such a beautiful way to end the year because I know with the holiday season and the end of the year and the new year and all of that, I just thought, why not go to one of the deepest places we've ever gone on the Amy Ehlers show? Because we're really going to talk about life after life, life after quote unquote death. We're going to talk about really going into that space where we can communicate with our beloveds who have transitioned to the other side, also known as dying, as we like to call it here on the earthly plane. And I have an incredible special guest for us today to talk about this topic. She's a dear friend of mine, a woman who I deeply, deeply admire. She, Her life force is one of those things where when I get to have lunch with darling Christina Rasmussen, I feel like the the sky has opened up and the sun has shone on me. It's just like this incredible experience. And I'm so excited for those of you who don't know Christina and her incredible work for you to meet her today. So Christina Rasmussen is an internationally recognized educator on grief. And she's the author of Second First. And her first book, Second First, I have to tell you, is the book that I give two friends of mine that lose a loved one. I usually write about six months and then I actually send them a copy of this book in the mail because it, is, because it is honestly the best book on grieving I've ever read in my entire life. She's founder of the Life Reentry Institute, Second Verse, and Star Letters. Christina has been featured as a woman working to do good in the White House blog. Her work has been featured on NPR, ABC News, and MariaShriver.com. She lives here in the San Francisco Bay Area with her family. Christina, thank you so much for being here with me today. Amy, thank you so much for having me. And I'm sitting here. No, you can't see me smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited about this conversation we're about to have. Your new book is called Where Did You Go? And as I, I shared with you before we started recording here, you know, I thought that this book was going to be something completely different than it is. I was sharing that I I was determined, bound and determined to reach a certain point in the book, which we'll talk about before our interview today. And I had read part of it and I was so engrossed in it. And then I decided to go take a bath and just read a little bit of the book. And I could not get out of the bath until I got through this one section. I like literally couldn't. And I was reading on my phone of all things. Like I'm reading in the bathtub. I'm turning into a prune. But I'm like, I can't leave the sanctuary of this bathroom because it's the only place my little darling daughters won't bug me. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And then I did the first exercise in the book and had an incredible experience. And I'm just so excited. So everyone, if you have lost someone that you love, run and grab your copy of Where Did You Go? You will not regret it. You will love it. So, okay. So, Christina, start by just sharing a bit about your personal story because that's really what got you into this work as a grief educator and also with the Where Did You Go? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Amy, first of all, I can't wait to hear about your experience later (laughs) on. Um, And, and, you know, as readers uh, go further into the book, there's... um, 
uh, actually someone who endorsed it um, said a plot twist. And um, mm-hmm. I went in to find out about death and I discovered life and where we create from. And it's been a, an unbelievable, extraordinary journey. But before we go there, I want to share with everyone my, I guess, my origin story or my beginning and and, and what happened in my life to kind of um, put me on this path Um In 2003, early 2003, my then 31-year-old husband was diagnosed with colon cancer um, and and stage 4. And at the time, we had a 9-month-old baby um, and a a 2.5-year-old daughter. And I remember hearing the news and... I, I, I became dehydrated. I, I, my body stopped working. Um, I spent the next couple of days basically breathing in a, in a paper bag because I wanted to throw up all the time. It was the worst day of my life. And then about three and a half years later, he died. Um, he passed away at age 35, um, the second worst day of my life. And I started on a journey on that day that was very difficult And what I want to mention to everyone um, who's listening, prior to me experiencing grief in a personal level, I had studied grief at a professional level. I did my thesis on the stages of bereavement. I studied grief. I, I wanted to know how to help people. But when I experienced it, I realized that it was so much more devastating than I ever imagined. It was... The, the, actually, there are no words to describe what it was, and I was furious with the world that nobody had prepared me mm. for such a difficult journey. And I realized, Amy, then that millions of people felt what I have felt and were feeling at that time what I was feeling. And I couldn't believe the world kept going around just like that. So I, I promised myself then that if I was ever to make it back <laughs> to, to, to a good life again, I was going to go back and get everyone else. So in 2010, uh, so four years after his passing, I founded um, my company at the time. It was called Second First. And I slowly started um, writing um, very small paragraphs uh, on Facebook. And people started following me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's still shocked by that, actually. Um, I'm, I'm still surprised as to uh, people just saying yes to what I was writing. And then more and more people started joining that little Facebook page, which then became a big one. Uh, publishers knocked on my door. A first book was published in 2013. Um, uh, which has the process that I call life reentry. Um, it helps people exit uh, the place between two lives, the life we left behind, um, and the life we could still have. And most people die in the way die in the middle. Uh, millions of people die here, thinking that was their second life. Um, and then I think what happened along the way. After freeing thousands of people from the waiting room, helping thousands of people uh, re-enter their life after loss, doing all this great work, there was one question that remained. Um, one question that not only was I still asking, but everyone else was asking too, was what happens when we die? Yeah. Where do our people go when they're so alive here and so present here one day and gone the next? And that was a really big question. Um, that I had to answer for myself first and foremost. Um, And it wasn't an easy one. I have to say at first, I was doing it secretly. (laughs) (laughs) I was secretly looking for the answers and um, and I was finding, um, you know, I was finding them. And I was catapulted into a world that was so unexpected and so magnificent and so beautiful. And I was so immersed in this. That for some reason, I, for, for a long time, had decided not to really share it with anyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know that that's a tough, um, tough thing to decide and a selfish thing to decide um, because I was afraid um, to talk about it and I was afraid to share it. Um, what afraid, were you afraid of? I was afraid that it would... Um, it would destroy the credibility that I that I had built with life reentry. The life reentry work is doing so well, and it's helping many people. It's growing. Uh, we have uh, two potential um, studies that are about to take place in the next three years. 
from a, a major foundation. We we have incredible board members on board organizations that are seeking us out. And now all of a sudden, think about this, right? The founder and CEO of the Life Range Institute is writing about the death um, and the afterlife and what happens when we die. It doesn't sound great for someone who doesn't believe from for, for the scientific traditional world um, that stays away from that topic. So I was turning it down for just that reason, unfortunately. What inspired you to risk bringing it out into the world in this way, despite that, knowing that you were risking? You see, what happens is um, when you uh, enter this field of knowledge and energy, and when you start to live your life from this incredible place and knowing um you start i started feeling that as if i was lying to everyone Mm -hmm. and it was going against everything i was and then i decided you know okay fine i will talk about this but i will write a novel about it right (laughs) i will will take all this science and i will still write that the the trilogy the the livia livia wood trilogy i will write this next but but i started writing fiction and i'm like okay fine i will write fiction then everyone's going to be happy i will take everything i know and put it into this uh work of fiction and my my non-fiction work will stay intact and as i was writing uh livia i was about five chapters in I kept finding the truth. Um, Everything that I learned was so true and so real. And the way the universe was really was was nothing like what we think it is. And I started wanting to share this with people. And I remember one day my agent and I had a Skype call and I was saying, you know, I could write this next book of After Second First, you know, or I could write this book, Where Did You Go?, and she turns around and says, the light in your eyes <laughs> <laughs> tells me that you have to write this. So I stopped Livia. I stopped writing Livia and I started creating a proposal for where to go. Um, and and at the same time, running, um, starting to, to run the pilot class to, to see if the uh, process that I had created uh, was solid and it worked. Um, and that's how it all began two years ago now. Wow. So one of the things that I found so fascinating when diving into Where Did You Go is that you've really created a system, a process, like a step-by-step process for people to be able to connect with their loved ones who have passed. And not only have you done that, but you've also utilized, and this is one of the reasons why I love Second First as well, is you've utilized brain science Mm -hmm. to really help us understand why we prevent ourselves from going there all the time and and how to actually get past the barriers of our brain and the way that our brains work in order to access that world. Yes. And, you know, this is, and I'm going to go on record saying this, um, this is the second and final process or system that I'm going to create. Life reentry was for the physical, is for the physical reality, the navigating of that, and this. And I and I call, I used to call this beyond reentry. Actually, um, when it was the, the first class was called beyond reentry. It wasn't the temple journey. Um, the temple, the word temple was given to me, and. <laughs> I had no choice but to say yes to it while on the journey with the class, but it was called Beyond Reentry. And before I, I step in there, Amy, I have to tell you something really bizarre that happened right in the beginning. I used to have this document, um, this Google document that I would I had written all the steps on it before the class was there, and I was adding, you know, I was the content of the process. And do you know what the the document was called for a really long time until, until I realized how special it was. It was called um, BR Steps. And BR is the, the initials of, of my husband. Oh, my gosh. No. Yeah. Wow. And I didn't realize the meaning of it. I have chills every time I think about it um, until weeks later. And I, I, was, I was talking to my assistant and we were on Skype and all of a sudden, we were looking at the document and he just hit me over the head. Wow. 
he was literally guiding me. <laughs> it was be our steps. <laughs> and that was, that was, his name is Biana Rasmus. That, that was he doesn't have a middle name. That's it. B R. That was his initials, you know. And um, it blew me away that that's what it was called, and I hadn't seen. I didn't realize it until much later. Um, but yeah, so the beginning of this journey, I knew that. I had to find a way to trick the brain. Um, the brain is the filter. It is the engine. It is uh, our projection mechanism. We actually project. It's um, we project a movie. Um, you know, Amy, and this is a hard thing to say to everyone who's listening to this. <laughs> I don't even tell myself and tell you. Um, just imagine if what I'm going to say next is true. Just imagine what that means, that we actually live in a holographic experience here, that our um, reality, what we call physical reality, the third dimension, is being projected via the second dimension, which is non-local. And the the brain that we have with us kind of um, projects it out, puts it, we put it in a time um, time is not real outside of here. Everything through that projection is linear. There's cause and effect. There's past, present, and future. And all of those things live inside a hologram. Okay. So now <laughs> I know there's going to be people <laughs> listening who are going to be like, what is Christina talking about? That the, my life, like my brushing my teeth in the morning and going and doing my job and trying to get the kids' lunches together, that that's all a hologram. How do you, how do you know this? Like, how did you experience life in that way? What has you come to that conclusion? Well, the, the, first of all, I've read this. I read this I mean, in gazillions of books that, that says that the holographic principle actually was proved early in 2017. So if you um, if you were to Google the holographic principle model, um, you'll see all the scientists and studies that have been done on this. So physical matter, the, the you know, what your desk looks like and feels like, your computer, everything that you're holding – is basically a light show illusion made of this vibrating energy. Um, And, you know, apparently, which which is just mind blowing matter. And when I say the word matter is this, this, the, the solid aspects of our physical world matter, this physical matter is only energies that are stable in a, in some kind of vibrating equilibrium, vibrating state. Um, it is an excited state in a field, so it looks like it's physical, but it, 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 it's uh, solid, but it isn't. Um, it's an interaction of energy, basically, that is slightly different than the interaction of energy that you don't, you can't see. So if you were to kind of go in very close into your phone or your desk or everything, um, you actually find nothing. Um, basically, we are the movie inside the television uh, screen that you have in your house or the movie theater. We are real, but it's also an illusion. And so is it, if we follow this through then, then when we die, Mm -hmm. is the hologram simply released at that point? Yes. You're amazing. So (laughs) So, I'm like, wait a minute, that's what happens. So when we die, all that is gone is the hologram, Mm -hmm. the vibrating, non-local energy of what we are is still there and continues to exist. And, you know, religion actually and science are in agreement of that higher realm, that heaven, you know, you, you know, religion calls it heaven, science calls it a, a different dimension where light and energy is being projected into this world comes from that higher level of of place. Um, And it's it's invisible. We actually can't see it. Um, And we can't hear anything. You know, your ears cannot detect sounds under um, 20,000 hertz. Uh, But the reality of, you know, what sounds sound like and vibrate, um, they're as high as 10 billions of, of, of hertz you know they, we are not able to hear also we're not able to see what's out there we can't see everything so just 
knowing that, and there's a, there's an amazing um, physicist that said uh, Robert Lanza that says we only die in someone else's reality and not in ours. So think then, about that, Amy. Yeah, I mean, this is profound, and this is it's funny because <laughs> as I've lost people that I've loved over the years, I always have felt this sensation of. I really get that they still exist in a different form than what I can see. And I still really, really miss them in my physical reality, Mm -hmm. you know, and that, that longing and that missing of the hug or the conversation or being able to call them on the phone in that way. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, exploring this topic with you and reading, where did you go? It's it, there's this way in which all of a sudden you get to have that interaction yes. again, not yes. in the same way, not in the same hologram, right? But but by us deciding to drop the hologram for even a few moments a day to venture in, yes, right through the doorway, which is the first step in this process, is walking through the doorway. And that's the, the, the journey that I went on actually this morning. And <laughs> it, and it's, it, it's really fascinating to utilize all of what you've gathered and learned from your research and from your own experience. And then what you've used with your own students and colleagues and loved ones in order to experience this. So I know that people listening are like, okay, well, tell me, Christina, how do I get to the other side? Like, how do I visit these people? And is it safe to do so? (laughs) I know there was someone in my class that said, what if I never come back? I'm like, don't worry, you're coming back. There's Mm -hmm. no, you know, just shutting down the hologram or like, you know, shifting our attention from the physical reality to the non-physical one doesn't take you away from here. Um, we just need to learn to to see differently, um, hear differently, um, and, you know, understand that we are in control of actually, you know, uh, and I will talk a little bit later about this, but beyond, you know, co- communicating with the energy that used to be you know, physically our husband or wife or child, um, we also are able to project um, a hologram, a physical reality uh, in accordance to our beliefs and thoughts and um, perception of the world, which is, which is actually a hard thing to know that we are in control of our universe and our reality. It's a very hard thing to know. So the very first step, um, I had to find a way to convince the brain to let me go further Mm -hmm. beyond this physical reality. So I had to tell the brain that I was to leave this reality and enter a new one and I had to go through a a doorway or or, um, an opening of some sort. And people always ask me, Christina, are you really guiding people in a visualization? I always say no. And this is why I say no. Um, and so they say, what is this? Where, where are you taking that? What, what does this mean? And I say, this is a journey. And everyone's journey is different. And this is why when I took my very first 50 people through that exercise to go through the, the, the opening, the doorway, and onto the other side and to experience the shift in energy and this shift in vibration and how they felt and bring them back. That's all I wanted to do in that first exercise. I didn't want to do anything else. The very first thing that they told me when they came back, and let me tell you, Emmy, I was holding my breath. Like I was literally <laughs> saying this is make or break. This is either going to be or not going to be. And, it, and I have to send back my contract. And say, like, this, yeah. is, this is time of the truth, truth time. You know, they came back and I remember them. The very first thing they said was my door. And this is everyone's comment was not the same as the door you told us to look at. Mm. Very first time I did this exercise beyond, you know, the class, I used to have my own door. And it used to look in a specific way. So I gave them my door, thinking that they would all see my door and they go through them my door. What we learned was immediately was that everyone's opening was completely different from everyone else's. Well, and it makes sense, right? Because when we're when we're looking and right, well, first of all, it makes sense if you go back to the hologram 
everyone's hologram is different. Yeah, so of course exactly. their doorway is going to be different. Yes, and absolutely. just in my experience as a coach and leading people on a lot of different journeys and having people go on different visualizations over the years, I've done, you know, a lot of meditating and visualizing, but I haven't ever done it with this intent yes. that your work yeah. has. Right. But I, you know, over the years, it's like trying to really open it up for people to just have their own experience, which you do so beautifully in the book of just like, observe what your door looks like. Look at what that looks like for you. And and the thing is, you know, and I think when people say, you know, I'm guiding you, you know, we're not guiding them, right? Actually, we are just giving them permission to go on their own journey in many ways. We're, we're telling them it's okay to go there where you're going is as real as here actually it's more real <laughs> than here we just we find it very hard to believe how real it is to go through that gateway and i could have said um i could have said let's go down this nice path or you know let's let's follow the the, the stream but but um i didn't do that because i believe that the um actually um, amy i did not even when i ask for a doorway and I used to I was fighting it and fighting it all the way to the last night before the first class was to to happen and I was like this is too simple this is too simple I can't ask for a doorway. <laughs> right. they're not they're gonna say what is that what you're asking us to do and then I had a dream that night before the class that I was asleep and it was very real dream that my door in my bedroom which opens to the deck opened and I got up in the dream and I was being, um, uh, you know, told to go through the door and out. And I felt this most magnificent energy um, telling me to go and see what was on the other side. And in the dream, I went through and, of course, I woke up and I knew, OK, I'm going to say yes to this. And then I went online and did a lot of research on on doors and mystical doors and doorways that actually teleported people. There are actually openings and doorways around the, the earth that have had, um, you know, people talk about going through them and finding themselves in a very different place. So the thing is, there is nowhere to go. The temple world that I talk about in my book is here, but the brain needs to be told that it has to exit this place and enter a new place to believe that it's accessing a new reality. It is. The brain is is actually stupid. (laughs) (laughs) It really is. (laughs) <laughs> well, it's designed to create the hologram, right? So, right. It's, it, yeah. right? So it's like, yeah. okay, let's put that aside. And, you know, and I, I love this. I, I'll tell you, I'll share with all of you yeah. listeners. First of all, I just want to say if this is intriguing to you, that as you can hear from listening to Christina, she is one of the most grounded people I know while also being one of the most mystical Um, women that I know and people that I know. And that's one of the reasons why I feel like the work that you do in the world works so well is because it's not from this space of not, you know, you've done your scientific research, you've looked at things and then you've tried things and you've, and you've proven your processes before you even put them out in this book format. And now you're just giving people access to it in a new way. Yes. Yeah, I know. And, and, you know, when, when I read that Einstein said that, you know, with his special theory of relativity, that space and matter are the same. I mean, if Einstein, <laughs> this is the thing that just blows me away, Amy, right? Einstein says, you know, the nothingness that you see in front of you and your desk are the same thing. Think about that. <laughs> like, hello. Like, I just want to keep it as simple as possible, right? And 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 and, and, and we're not even going to talk about, you know, oh, you know, the dimensions. Like, just think about that. That that if Einstein tells me that my desk that I have right here and the air around it, the space, is actually made of the same thing, I can't live my life thinking that the, the desk is solid and the space around it isn't. I have to change the way I look at my world. And if I do that, then when I tell my brain to go to a place that is not solid, I also tell my brain to go to a place that is as real 
as the desk and the space around a desk because both of those places are one and the same. There is an exercise in the book that I had to put in there to provide proof for the brain that the temple world that we go to inside the book is actually connected with the physical world here. And you may not have gone further down the book, but I ask uh, people to look for an object in step two or three um, and to not worry about what the object is um, when they're in there Um, and to look at the object, observe the object. There's something called the observer effect, um, which projects the reality. Whatever we observe, whatever we look at, think about actually uh, translates into physical reality. Um, You know, the scientific version of the law of attraction is this is why it works. It's science. It's real, Amy. This is not real. This is not fake. So they would go and find this object, and then in the week ahead, because we had a, a week between the classes, without looking for this, however kind of unique their object was, that to trust that it would just show up in their reality. And when it did, that is when the brain was able to evolve into a higher level of understanding of reality because you cannot make the brain believe. You have to provide the proof. So when we find, by accident, we find the object that we saw in the temple here, um, and it is a strange and unique object that you can imagine, out of the blue, it blows us away. And we start to believe, slowly but surely, that the invisible world is as real and even more so than the, phys- the, the visible one. And if the person who's died, or the word death is actually so silly, um, sorry to say it like this, but so when the person who used to have a physical hologram is no longer able to do so, it doesn't mean that they don't exist in the other realities. It doesn't mean that their experience has also ended because our experience of them has ended. And when that physicist said, you know, we die only in someone else's reality and not in ours, if my husband, Biana, died in my reality and my girl's reality, but he continued in his reality, would that be a shame for me not to know this? Yeah, right. Well, you know, it's interesting because when I did my my first um, journey here that's outlined in the book called The Doorway, and I went through the door waiting for me on the other side, which I know that you said sometimes it happens where a loved one is there and sometimes they're not there and either is totally fine. But in my case, she was there, which was my um, my mother-in-law, my husband's birth mom. Um, who had given him up for adoption and they were reunited. She sought him out and they were reunited when he was in his early 20s. And she was such a beautiful part of our life. And one of my favorite people ever. She's just an incredible person who also unfortunately had massive chronic pain issues and ended up committing suicide. And so her name is Johnny. And so um, when I went through the portal, Johnny was waiting there for me. And I immediately burst into tears. I could cry now just thinking about it. And I, you know, it was so interesting because I got to ask her all these questions about her suicide, like all of these unanswered questions that I've had for many, many years about, you know, what, you know, it it was interesting too, because it was such a cosmic conversation because it was like 70 million questions answered in one second. There's no like, right. There was no time space. It was just like, (laughs) okay, understanding. (laughs) Okay. Understanding. Right. And, and so it was this really, um, beautiful forgiveness and understanding and compassion and I could tell like she was like her energy in in life when she was doing well she was like an eager little girl all the time she was just her spirit was so beautiful I always said like her spirit was running on the beach and then there she was limping and at one point towards the end of her life she was in a wheelchair like it was just really hard but her spirit was so pure in this other realm and it was so beautiful because she's been waiting for me for a long time. Yes. Yes. You know, because she's been gone for a long time, over a decade. And yes. so it, it was like this this otherworldly uh, communication that happened. And she has been waiting for you. That is, that is the message that 
that that we get when you know and like you said it's okay if they're not there yet it has nothing to do with your beloveds you know if 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 when you go through the, the doorway and there's nobody there, it just means that your brain needs to let go a little more. Like it doesn't, it has nothing to do with your experience, the, the, whether your beloved is there or not. It's just our filter can be a little tricky in the beginning. And, and sometimes I even go and I see nothing. I have mm-hmm. no, because I'm just, my brain is not where it needs to be to have that experience. And, um, but what you experienced, Amy, and the speed in which you experienced it, the, the 70,000 million questions in one second, you know, I'm smiling here because this was very much the experience of a lot of people. And it was surprising. Yeah. And it came from people like you and I were like, who question things who say, you know, really, did I really, was this real, a real experience for me? And one of the main questions that people asked uh, was, did I really experience that? Right. And that's the brain questioning it, right? And this, I call it the survivor self, our fear center, right? It's saying, did, did that really happen or just did I make it up? And that is the question that we have to keep answering and keep experiencing until it, we don't ask that question anymore because we are so used to not trusting our ability to connect with what what is invisible with what is coming from a non-local place um, that is vibrating from the second dimension out into here. We're so used to not connecting to that. And she has been waiting and, and they are waiting. And I will share this image that I experience when I go into my temple now. And there's a place that I call the field that is, that is four steps down the road, five steps, the fifth step, which is the final step. It is the field. And when I go in the field, I see thousands, millions of people that I know are, have passed. They all hold the book on their chest. Mm. They're waiting. And they're waiting. Wow. And how could I leave them waiting? And people can call me crazy. Um, you know, I hide my book from LinkedIn. <laughs> 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 but I had to do what was the right thing to do, Amy, you know? Yeah. I had to. <laughs> well, and if, you know, I when we look at going to mediums or visiting psychics or what have you, or people who we feel like have the gift, whether you believe in that or not, people who are listening, um, <laughs> oftentimes I feel like, you know, we want them to say the person's name or we want them to say a special memory that only the two of us could share to help our brain relax to say this is real. Yes. Right. And so, you know, I've been a fan of television shows that have, you know, feature mediums and what have you, and then people are blown away by that. And it's like, and I get it now that that's just the only way that their brains will let them believe. Yes. What a a gift for us to just say, I'm going to, I'm going to choose to believe. Yeah. And and the reason why I shared the science, the quantum mechanics, the physics, the, the, the things that we know about our universe already is because it actually makes, you know, the journey um, more real. And when we know that what we think is real is actually a projection of light um, that makes an image. And if we if we allow ourselves to believe that to be true, if we believe, you know, all these amazing physicists, then anything is possible. Mm. Anything is possible. And to communicate, and someone said to me, Christina, you must make sure people know that you're not speaking to the dead in the way people think that we speak to the dead. Mm. Speak to their consciousness and they speak to mine. Like the way communicating with the so-called dead does not have to look like ghosts and darkness and monsters and scary things and doors that you know make sounds and this 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 is actually wrong in many ways in my eyes i think that um i think that communicating with someone who is no longer in the physical form is so much more eloquent and brilliant and faster than anything else than than the way that movies can portray this reality and i'm a little sad about it and that's why i get a lot of uh, some hate right right I'm not, we're not speaking to the dead in the way that we think we are. We are connecting to the part of them that never dies. Right. It's, we are timeless. 
we don't want, there is no end. The energy can never be destroyed ever. Right. So what has been the impact for you as you've gone into the temple world so much over these last two years, and I'm sure beyond, because I know that you worked on it before you ever talked to anybody about it. You were having your own experiences. How has that impacted your physical day-to-day reality? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, A few things have happened. Um, I'm still very human. And um, the reason why I I have done the work that I've done is because I am the most you know, <laughs> human, imperfect person you would ever meet. I, you know, struggle with my fears and my doubts as much as, or even more so than everyone else. Um, I, I struggle uh, with um, letting go and saying goodbye to someone I loved. Um, not just struggle, I suffer from that a lot. So um, for this, I think every day, this year has been uh, the most um how should I say, I've created so much actually in my physical reality that at this point it's, it's too much <laughs> mm-hmm. because of, because I go into my temple every day and now my temple, when I go into the opening, um, it is so real. And so 3d, I get vertigo from just being like, I have to open my eyes and come back because I'm getting vertigo from standing there. Yes. It's so real. It's so real. Um, I go in there and, and not just create, I'm immersed in, a, in the reality that I choose to experience in my physical world. So I see, I see a version of my reality that I want to have. Um, and the more I do that, the more this physical reality is taking place. But when you make a lot of dreams come true, actually, it's hard. Mm, <laughs> because you right. don't have enough time to be in all of these dreams that you're making reality. <laughs> I have so many things going on. I'm like, Christina, just let's just choose now. Now that you know anything is possible and you can do anything you want, let's choose. And then I also realized that the um, your fears and your doubts and your beliefs are very hardwired. So even if you do choose to observe and experience a reality inside your temple that you choose, it takes a lot of time to observe the reality that you want and to change the beliefs um, that are programmed inside your brain, which is the the engine and the project the projector of the of the physical reality. Um, I believe that death is not real. Um, I still don't want to die uh, because I actually like this experience. Um, but it's good to know that when I do, I'm actually excited to experience and have the awareness of of, of, of the transition. Um, but I do not want this to happen for a really long time. Right. I, uh, my girls have had new memories and new experiences with their dad. And that has been mind blowing. When that, when I took them to the temple, they saw their dad and, and, and interacted with their dad. Um, one of the very first times I saw him, um, he immediately communicated with me that he wanted to see the girls. And I was a little, I was, um, like as if that was the most important thing. And I was like, right. well, you're I, like, hello, I, what am I? Hello. I have to see me, you know. <laughs> right. Then my husband, you know, I've been, you know, I'm, I'm remarried and I'm married to this wonderful human being. The other day, Amy, he turned around <laughs> and he said to me, you know, I mean, he's known I've been writing this book and I've been talking about this book with him for a long time. And he said to me, so <laughs> are you still looking for him? You know, where to go? <laughs> and I said to him, honey, I love you. You are part of my physical reality here. I know where he is. I just need to answer that question for myself. Um, I had to say yes to my own version of the journey after loss. And it had to do with both my navigating my physical reality life and then this higher level invisible world that was right there for me to step into and I could not go there. It doesn't mean that I love you any less. Um, it just means that I see that the people we've lost. You see, you know, one of the things that I say, Amy, is that love, the feeling of love, can you see it? Mm. No, right? right? No, yeah. You can't see the love. You feel it. And love transcends time and space. So when we when we try to move on and create a new life, which I really believe in, we must always 
create a new physical reality after loss. I believe in that so much. But we don't have to stop loving the essence of the people we've lost. And yes, we do grieve. And does it make grief easier? No, not for a long time. At first, you will experience the difficulty nature of grief. You will experience the pain. We, like you said, Amy, in the beginning, you know, you you don't you can't hug them, right. you can't be with them, you will miss them. That's not going to go away. But ultimately, along the road, you knowing that they actually continue to exist in, in a way that is hard to understand will help us on our journey of healing. Very much so. So I know we're we're starting to wrap up here. And again, everyone, the name of the book is Where Did You Go? And the URL to purchase the book, of course, will be in the show notes. And I just highly recommend that if this is resonating with you to venture in and go on these journeys, because as I shared, like I'm already blown away <laughs> by whatever I already experienced. And, and, and I just, I just think you're so fascinating, Christina. And I so appreciate you sharing all of this amazing knowledge with the world and with my listeners. I have one final question for you, which is a question that I actually ask all my guests, which it's kind of a funny question in the context of what we've been talking about. But the question is, what's messy and what's magical about your life these days? Mm. And I guess I'm talking about the holographic version of your life, I guess. <laughs> Uh, and you know, and you know, people, and I, I still say this too, like in the context of everyday life. You know, this is kind of supernatural, but actually, it is. Every, this is real. This is yes. this is our life, the way it really is, and the way it looks. We are actually vibrating strings of light. And this is not a woohoo kind of statement. We really are our light. <laughs> like we ha- we are made of light. There's nothing strange about this or kind of weird. It's true. It's reality. Um, and what is messy and magical in my life? Um, what is messy is um, my human way of trying to uh, control time uh, every day. I have a million things to do, um, especially now as the book is about to be born and um I find it hard. I find it. I find busyness hard. I'm so busy all the time. I, um, I have my to do list, my errands, my to do list is so long. So it's messy. I'm not the organized kind of woman. I'm not like this perfect, you know, expert where I have everything kind of in this organized experience. I'm messy. Um, my girls, um, one is in college, the other one is, you know, 16. She's figuring things out for her life. We are a blended family, so it's always going to be messy. And that is my projected physical reality that I'm projecting from um, this two-dimensional world. And what is magical is my knowing that I can make anything I want come true. And I'm about to start um, a graduate degree in painting and art uh, in my spare time. (laughs) (laughs) Because that's right. the one thing I never made happen from an education point of view. I, I've sold paintings, I paint, um, but I never was taught how to paint. So um, for me, that's so magical <laughs> that I'll go and do an art class at either Berkeley or the Academy of Art in San Francisco, like to to become a to be a real artist, like like one of the real ones. <laughs> that is magical to me um and i and magic for me is is the simplicity of of saying uh-huh. yes to something to something like that thank you so much for tuning in to today's best of episode make sure to check out the latest happenings at wakeupcallcoach.com that's wakeupcallcoach.com keep embracing the messiness and the magic of life bye-bye